Hello, and welcome to the second episode of the Software Carpentry Lecture on Make. This episode will introduce you to Make's basic features. As we said in the opening episode, Make is a tool to manage tasks and dependencies. To illustrate how it works, here's the dependency tree for the paper that the robot is working on. Paper.pdf depends on paper.wdp, the raw word processor file, and on figure1.svg and figure2.svg. Figure1.svg depends on summary1.dat, which in turn depends on data11.dat, data12.dat, and so on, while figure2.svg depends on files with similar names. In order to create paper.pdf, we have to run the command wdp to pdf paper.wdp. For the purpose of this lecture, it doesn't matter what wdp to pdf actually does. All we need to know is that if paper.wdp or either of the figure SVGs change, we need to rerun this command. To recreate figure1.svg, we run sgr-n-r summary1.dat and send the output to figure1.svg. The backslash in the slide is not part of the command, it's just the standard Unix way to break a line into pieces. Again, it doesn't matter for now what the sgr command actually is. What matters is that we need to run it whenever figure1.svg is out of date, i.e. whenever it is older than the summary1.dat file it depends on. Finally, in order to update summary1.dat, we need to run our own little script, stats.py, with all the files named data1-something.dat as input. We don't know in advance how many of these there will be. We could conceivably have dozens or hundreds of raw data files to summarize. The little program stats.py adds one more wrinkle to our example problem. We're constantly updating it as we think of new ways to process our raw data files. We're also finding and fixing bugs more often than we'd like. Each time it changes, we should probably update summary1.dat just in case a new feature or bug fix changes the summary values. We should therefore include stats.py in the list of things summary1.dat depends on so that changes to stats.py will trigger recalculation of summary1.dat. This is all a bit much to digest at once, so let's look at the simplest piece. How can we get make to recreate figure1.svg automatically whenever summary1.dat changes? Let's start by going into the directory containing the files we're using in the paper and use the ls command to get a listing of what's there. The dash t flag to ls tells it to list things by age with the youngest file first and the oldest last. This listing tells us that our data file summary1.dat is newer than the SVG file that depends on it, so the SVG file needs to be recreated. Using our favorite editor, let's create a file called hello.make and put these three lines in it. A configuration file for make, like this one, is called a make file. The first line, starting with hash, is a comment. Your comments should be more meaningful than just the name of the file. The second and third lines are a rule that tell make what we want to do. The file name on the left of the colon in the first line is the target of the rule. The rule tells make how to update or recreate this file. The target's prerequisites, the things it depends on, are listed to the right of the colon. In our case, figure1.svg only has one prerequisite, summary1.dat. The second line of the rule is its action. This tells make what shell command or commands to run to bring the target up to date if it is older than any of its prerequisites. This rule only has one command, but a rule can contain any number. One thing to note is that the actions and rules must be indented with a single tab character. Make will not accept spaces or mixes of spaces and tabs. As we said in the introduction, it was written by a summer intern in 1975, and sometimes that shows. Now that we've created our make file, we can tell make to obey its instructions by running gmake from the command line. Many systems make make an alias for gmake, so if the latter doesn't work for you, try the former name as well. The arguments dash f hello.make tell make that we want it to use the commands in the file hello.make. If we don't tell it what file to look in, it looks for a file called makefile in the current directory and uses that if it exists. And here's make's output. It has run the command we wanted it to. This happened because at least one prerequisite for figure1.svg was newer than figure1.svg itself. 
By default, Make uses the time a file was last modified as its age. Opening a file in an editor to view it doesn't change this timestamp, but any change to its contents will. Since summary1.dat's timestamp was younger than figure1.svg's, Make ran the shell command we gave it and created a new version of figure1.svg. Now let's run Make again. This time, it doesn't execute any commands. This happened, or rather didn't happen, because the target is newer than its prerequisites. Since there's nothing to bring up to date, make doesn't change anything. If we were only allowed one rule per file, make wouldn't be any simpler than typing commands by hand or putting them in little shell scripts. Luckily, make allows us to put any number of rules in a single configuration file. Here, for example, is another make file called double.make with rules to recreate both figure1.svg and figure2.svg. These rules are identical except for the ones and twos in the file names. We'll see later how to combine these rules into one. Let's pretend we've just updated our data files by running touch star.dat. The Unix touch command doesn't change the contents of files, but updates their timestamps as if they had been modified. Now, when we run make, it recreates figure1.svg again, and then stops. Why wasn't figure2.svg recreated? The answer is that make uses the first rule in the make file as its default rule. Unless it's told otherwise, it only executes this rule. If we want make to rebuild figure2.svg, we have to tell it so explicitly. Here's the command. We use dash f double dot make to tell make what make file to use, and then give it the name of the target we want it to handle. Again, building things one at a time like this is slightly better than typing individual commands, but only slightly. To get make to build everything at once, we have to introduce a phony target. This is just a target name that doesn't correspond to any actual file. Since it doesn't actually exist, it can never be up to date, but other things can still depend on it. Here's our third make file, phony.make. We've introduced a phony target called all, which depends on figure1.svg and figure2.svg. If we type make all, make will decide that the all target is out of date, since there's no file called all in the current directory. And since all depends on figure1.svg and figure2.svg, make will go and update them both, which is exactly what we want. Let's touch our data files again and run make-f phony.make all. Sure enough, Make runs the SGR command twice to recreate both figures. One thing to note, though, is that the order in which commands are executed is arbitrary. Make could decide to update figure2.svg first rather than figure1.svg because there's no dependency to respect between the two. Make could also update them in parallel if it had more than one processor to use. We'll return to this idea later. Something else this example shows us is that a single thing can be a target in one rule and a prerequisite in others. The dependencies between the files mentioned in the make file make up a directed graph. In order for make to run, this graph must not contain any cycles. For example, if x depends on y, y depends on z, and z depends on x, there is nothing make can build first. Everything it might build depends on something else. If it detects a cycle in a make file, make will print an error message and stop. Unfortunately, whether or not a cycle exists depends on which files exist, and make's error message is usually not particularly informative. Let's go back to our paper and look at another part of our dependency graph. Summary1.dat depends on all of the files data11.dat, data12.dat, and so on. The number of files isn't fixed. There could be one, a dozen, or a thousand. Writing a rule for exactly three files is easy. We just have one target and multiple prerequisites on a single line. But how do we generalize that to any number of files? And can we get rid of the repeated file names? Writing data11.dat, data12.dat, data13.dat twice is just asking for trouble. Sooner or later, we'll add a file to one line, but forget to update the other. We'll solve both of these problems together in the next episode.